All right, folks, I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Um, I'm Gene Jones. I'm uh, the Executive Director for the International Society of Technical Environmental Professionals. Um, we're putting this webinar together to give everybody an update on the revision to ASTM's E1527 2021 standard. And uh, we're going to jump right into it. Um, our presenter today is Nick Albergo. Uh, many of you have seen and, and heard Nick present in the past. Uh, Nick was uh, a former ASTM E5002 vice chair on environmental assessment and risk management and corrective action. Uh, he's been instrumental in the shaping of the standard itself over the years and has been involved in the not only the 1527, but 1528 and the 1903 standard. Uh, now is uh, Nick is now with uh, an environmental uh, engineer or an engineering professor at the University of South Florida, and is a senior advisor for uh, to GHD. So, Nick, I'm going to let you jump right into it. I'm going to turn my camera off so that everybody focuses on you and your slides. And just for everybody that is on the call, as I continue to admit some more folks that are joining in here, we are recording this and we'll make sure we get it out to everybody, um, you know, post event, along with the notes that Nick is going to provide um, about his slides. We're not releasing the slides themselves, but we are releasing notes uh, related to it. So with that, Nick, I'm going to turn it over to you and let you get started. Thank you. Good afternoon, all. Uh, we're going to talk about the new 1527-21 uh, standard. Um, EPA uh, is expected to issue its uh, approval at any moment. I can tell you that EPA was uh, actively involved in its development. So it's just a matter of it coming out in the uh, Code of Federal Regulations. So we expect to see it at any time right now. ASTM's already issued the new standard. All right, let's see. I've got to figure out how to advance my slides. There we go, hold on. All right. So uh, just as a, a bit of background, um, we uh, at ASTM issue uh, updates uh, based on sunset provisions to our standards every seven years or so. With regard to the uh, phase one, we've been pretty consistent about updating even a little bit sooner that than that, mostly because AAI requires that whatever we do, we do it consistent with good commercial and customary practice, which as you can imagine is a bit of a moving target over time. And as things have uh, emerged and developed, we uh, with the phase one have attempted to keep up with things as well. And um, th th this really was an opportunity to address some of the inconsistencies that we were aware of in the process and in just some of the quality of the document itself. And most importantly, there's been a, a relatively recent flurry of litigation and uh, outcomes and rulings that um, has also caused us to want to modify some of the things that we've got in the standard itself, as well as in the um, appendices. So that kind of gives you an idea why we did it. Um, what you'll find through my presentation and reading the new phase one is that uh, we've revised a number of the definitions and uh, added some new terminology. We try to bolster some of the discussion to assist in the interpretation of what is meant uh, by various aspects of the standard itself. There's been some limited changes to the historical research and site reconnaissance sections. Uh, we've added some important appendices that again, help provide some guidance to how you determine a recognized environmental condition and what that process looks like, even some examples uh, to go along with it. And we've also, as a result, uh, uh, made some changes to what we envision as the uh, report format and what needs to be included in the conclusion section. So um, just to get started, there, there's a number of what I'll call small editorial changes. Probably the most significant is we've incorporated the uh, uh, the term subject property now. The, uh, if you reviewed uh, prior phase one uh, standards, 
you'll notice we were all over the place. We sometimes called it a parcel. We called it a property, a subject property. Sometimes we use the word facility and um, it was confusing. And so what we've now done is we've cleaned all that up and you'll just see the term subject property, meaning the property that you are actually doing your phase one on. Now, oddly enough, after we went through all that effort, we decided to keep the title environmental site assessment. And that's because it's been pretty much commonly used in the industry. And it just seemed a bit unwieldy to go with environmental subject property assessment. Uh, but otherwise, we've made that change. Uh, <clears throat> we initially, when we first got started developing the standard, I, I think the first one we developed was in 1993. I think I started writing it about 1990. Um, it was the only product on the marketplace that defined good commercial and customary practice. But we've modified that now that EPA actually has an all appropriate inquiry rule. It's actually been around for quite some time now, 15 years. For those of you that do phase ones, you're probably aware that a number of the acronyms that are so associated with the standard uh, database searches have changed over the years or don't even exist anymore. And so the way we got around that is we just now identify websites and that way they can change the name all they want over time. And it shouldn't affect our document because we're just directing that you go to certain websites to identify the databases. Um, over time, we've recognized there's been some confusion about the circle of release definition, especially uh, how it pertains to exclusions. Uh, for many of you, you're, you're aware there are uh, uh, quite a few exclusions to the circular release definition. So what we've done is we've brought those into the body of the standard itself uh, to remind folks of some of the more salient examples of exclusions, for instance, uh, application of fertilizer and pesticides uh, at agricultural sites. Uh, is excluded from the release definition, as well as a number of other things. But just to remind folks to take the time to read the appendices on the uh, uh, legal uh, application of the standard itself uh, to get more information about it. And then we've also addressed a, a problem in the industry with the concern on the concept of de minimis condition, uh, reminding folks that in order to have a de minimis condition, there had to be a release first. So for instance, the fact that you identified a couple of 55 gallon drums uh, in a, a room is not a de minimis condition. Uh, there isn't such a thing until you actually have a release to the environment. Um, we went round and round about the concept of a data gap and a significant data gap and essentially came up with the concept that a data gap uh, that affects the ability of the EP to identify a wreck becomes a significant data gap. And if you've got one of those, then that's going to also uh, be presented within your conclusion section of your report. Um, the, the idea is that th there's all sorts of instances where there could be uh, small data gaps and what you're able to garner. A great example is that uh, data failure is one type of data gap that happens when, for instance, you weren't able to identify the uses of the property you know, in five year search intervals back to 1940 or first developed use. And in of itself, that's not that big of a deal. Uh, but if you've got a situation as an example where you know you're supposed to get into structures, especially those that might use, store, dispose of a hazardous substance or petroleum product, and you're unable to get in because it's locked or for whatever reason, um, that could be a significant data gap uh, because you're not able to identify what's in there, whether it's been released to the environment, what the conditions are. We also had uh, an issue with property use limitations. The attorneys especially did not like the concept of property use restrictions because uh, there are a number of restrictions, uh, zoning being one of them, that really has nothing to do with what we're after at ASTM. And so instead, we came up with the concept of a property use limitation. And you'll notice the definition talks about a limitation or a restriction on the future use of the property, but it's in connection with the response to a release. Uh, 
So what we're doing is we're tying um, institutional and engineering controls that are specific to environmental concerns. Those are the things that become our property use limitations and not the, uh, the population of other restrictions that um, aren't necessarily applicable uh, to ASTM. And that's essentially how we got around the issue of uh, restrictions. So we have a new definition for property use limitations now, and it's tied specifically to hazardous substance and petroleum products, and more importantly, the release of such. Uh, <clears throat> we've uh, at least brought some additional discussion into play about the nature of local agency interviews and the importance of them. Uh, unfortunately, people have gotten very comfortable with just simply sending out a freedom of information request. And um, oftentimes it's not answered or it's certainly not answered within the reasonably ascertainable timeline of 20 days. And that in, uh, they consider that the interview. And that was never uh, the intent of a local agency interview. The, the intent of the interview is to identify anything on a local level that um, may be considered for that area good and customary, good commercial customary practice in terms of what um, is available. As an example, uh, I'm in Tampa. Uh, Anybody that does phase ones in Tampa is aware that the city of Tampa maintains a, a database and a report of the 50 former landfills around the city, that are, many of which have since been developed. Um, if you're in Florida, you're probably aware that there's a database that the DEP keeps on cattle dip vats. And so these are obvious sources of information that should be included in a phase one in Florida because it's good commercial and customary practice to do so. And the databases are obvious, they're easy to get to. And so the idea of the local agency interview has always been, make sure you're not missing something that everybody else knows about in the area. And that typically looks at because you're unfamiliar with the area. And then uh, on top of that, recognize that uh, depending on where you're at and what jurisdiction you're working in, there can be differing definitions for what's considered a release or a disposal. And that may have a bearing on your phase one. I've seen instances where, you know, if all we're dealing with is dredge spoil on a finger and it was put there 55 years ago, um, when there were no regulations uh, in place, the DEP doesn't consider that disposal or a release, even though there could be arsenic there. Now, if you move that material from that location, that's different. But the mere presence of it doesn't constitute a release or disposal and wouldn't be a wreck as a result. Uh, PFAS is even more uh, uh, challenging because what we've got is, although the federal government has not, uh, as of yet, included PFOS or PFOAs in their uh, list of hazardous substances, there's about nine states that have. And uh, as a result of that, uh, many of these states also now have regulations in connection with it. So if you're working in a state where it is considered a hazardous substance and there are regulations, uh, it may be appropriate when you consider what's good commercial and customary practice to include a comment about it in your phase one, even though um, currently it's not listed as a federal hazardous substance. Uh, I mentioned here about the site reconnaissance. Uh, we've always focused on releases to the ground and uh, have now made a point of saying, hey, you could also have some sort of air emissions or uh, sources in the area where uh, uh, sites have been impacted the result of uh, particulate matter, point sources. Um, there's an example of that right now up in uh, northern port part of Florida in Inglis, where an entire neighborhood has been impacted by a local factory. And so that could be a uh, source uh, and a wreck, the result of air emissions and the release of uh, the contaminants to the ground, uh, the result of that. Um, I've also been involved in a couple of 
court cases recently that um, have surrounded the concept that as part of your research of historical uh, sources, uh, that you're supposed to do so consistent with uh, what a reasonable person would do. That's what the law talks about. And uh, I've got an instance where uh, a company, because of employee turnover, uh, wasn't aware that they had performed uh, several times uh, phase ones on the same property, but for a different client. And as a result, they never identified these uh, sources of information, which are clearly obvious. They were in their own files and had relevance to the site because they didn't check their own files uh, or do a, a proper conflict of interest check. And as a result of that, the whole question comes up, is this the kind of information that should be included in a phase one because it's obvious and it's reasonably ascertainable. And so that's the kind of direction of some of the new things in terms of practical considerations that you might wanna consider at your company, decide how you wanna handle it, what's the best way to deal with it. We have long since fought the idea of this 180 day shelf life of a phase one. And we're aware that there's been people out in the industry that you know, mess around with the date, typically because uh, they're, they've got other things going on in their uh, real estate transaction. And so they request that you go ahead and do the report, but that you don't issue to them yet until they're ready. And to get around that now, what we require is that you uh, identify in your report the date of initiation of the major task elements of a phase one. And whatever is the first one, first task you initiate, that actually starts the 180 day clock moving forward. And it's in the report itself. Um, <clears throat> we also now require that the EP uh, acknowledge whether or not the user has actually done an environmental lean search, which is their responsibility to make sure that it's being done. This is kind of going hand in hand, again, with our uh, activity and use limitation issues and whether or not there's an institutional or an engineering control in connection with the site that you're not aware of because you haven't seen the lean search. Uh, Many of you are probably familiar with our definition of an adjoining property and the concept that um, an adjoining property is one that would be adjacent, that either is adjacent or would be adjacent to your property had it not been for a road or thoroughfare and so forth. And as a result, uh, we've been seeing where unfortunately folks during the review of aerials and other kinds of uh, historical documents uh, don't comment on property that is adjacent because now it's under I-75 or I-275. And instead, we get a bunch of information on a property that's literally a half mile away you know, on the other side of the interstate or two interstates um, past the easement. And that's really, although that's important to do, that's not really what we're after. So we've uh, put some emphasis on the fact that while there may be a road or thoroughfare next to you, we're still concerned about what was there before it was a road and that there should be some comments uh, regarding that research at the time that you're providing comments about the subject property and adjoining properties as well. All right, uh, we also have in incorporated or expanded, if you will, uh, in the historical research, the standard sources that we want actually reviewed. Uh, you may recall that traditionally we gave you a number of possibilities, a, a list that you could look to, to try to fill in the blanks. And unfortunately, in some instances, people will look at aerials and if they don't have aerials, they just stop at that point. Don't do anything more to try to fill in the blanks, if you will. And so now we are mandating that these four uh, sources be used. And if they're not used, then you've got to describe why you didn't use them. And the, the key is that we want to get a uh, more 
complete understanding of the property uses over time and that realistically there are plenty of sources to do that. And so now we're mandating that those sources be looked into. And of course, you can still use the other sources that we've identified in the past, but now we've incorporated the idea that um, it's more than what you might just order an EDR. And, and if it's not an EDR, you're not interested type thing. Uh, so that comes into the whole concept of data failure. Um, we prefer not to see data failures. It's become customary to have data failures, unfortunately, but it's mostly because of laziness that people aren't looking at all the possible sources of information that could be of assistance to them. Uh, so with regards to, again, historical research, we've also put some more direction as to the kind of information we'd like to see in the report with regards to identifying the property and the uses of the property. We've been getting kind of lazy. Uh, as this product becomes more uh, commoditized. And so we want to make sure that in every report that boundaries are identified correctly, that there is some discussion of the size and the uses of the property and that you got the right address, especially if it's changed over time. Um, and then when we get to the uses, we want a little bit more specific information. You know, uh, not just retail or industrial manufacturing, but what is the nature? What's the specific use uh, so that users can understand better whether or not they should be concerned about a use over time? And clearly just saying something is industrial manufacturing in of itself uh, doesn't tell you a heck of a lot. So we'd like to see uh, more effort put into clarifying both the property definition, excuse me, the property description, as well as the uses uh, currently, as well as in the past. Uh, we also would like more information to support the findings and opinions section. And uh, so we've actually put in the report now that uh, the environmental professional is to provide their logic and reasoning in evaluating the information collected uh, so that we can more clearly understand what the finding and what their opinion is and what the basis of their opinion is so that we can follow through to conclusion. That doesn't mean we all have to agree on our conclusions. We leave that to each individual, but you should be able to provide your supporting rationale and your logic and reasoning for how you use the definition to come to a logical conclusion. Um, and with regards to these data gaps, which I talked about earlier, that if you're going to identify a significant data gap, that you discuss what needs to be done to clarify that gap. It could be as simple as I need access to the sh maintenance shed. It could be that simple. Or maybe you find out that the owner has an environmental report that was performed by some other company uh, to see if their tank leaked at some point because that's not publicly available information. Um, maybe you have a data gap because you're aware of the report, it's obvious. And so your uh, opinion is simply that being able to review that report could assist in determining rack or no rack. With regards to one of the appendices now, we've really uh, nailed down with a logic scheme how you determine rack or no rack. We've also uh, put in example scenarios, I think 13 of them or so, uh, examples of a rack, H rack, C rack, de minimis condition. And so, uh, and then finally, we've also uh, put some effort into breaking down the rack definition itself into more singular elements to help provide some more direction and clarity to what is the most important aspect of a phase one. So uh, that's all now in appendix four and uh, should go a long way into uh, bringing some consistency within the field regarding REC, no REC determinations. Uh, with physical setting sources, uh, we've traditionally relied on the USGS topographic map, primarily because it was a gross way 
of determining what's up gradient and down gradient, uh, assuming that groundwater flow follows topography. But the reality is that that's not always the case. And so now we've uh, uh, mentioned that there are certainly other types of uh, physical setting source information that could assist with determining migration and migration patterns, uh, be it the soils, be it uh, groundwater maps or potentiometric surface maps, and that these are easily also obtained uh, and so to the extent you need them or they would assist, we ask that you review them. And then I wanna talk just a bit about these various environmental conditions that now you're aware of. We've got three of them, the Rex, the HREX and the C-REX. And we've modified a bit uh, uh, the language associated with these various uh, uh, findings and conclusions. Uh, for those of you that are involved in the business, you're aware, already aware that the HREC or historical wreck is the scenario where there had been a release in the past, and it's been cleaned up to the unrestricted use criteria. Uh, whereas CREC, there's been a release in the past, but it's been cleaned up to something uh, less aggressive than unrestricted use, for instance, to the commercial standards versus the residential standards. And so th those things have really always been in play. Um, keep in mind that you can only have a REC, HREC, and CREC on your property. Uh, if we're talking about a tank that's leaking on the neighboring property, that'll never be a REC. Now, there may be a scenario where the result of that leaking tank is contaminated groundwater on your property, then it's the contaminated groundwater that's the wreck on your property, not the leaking tank on the neighboring property. Uh, <clears throat> so with regards to the wreck definition, we've done just some very slight rewording, but the most important thing we did is we brought a definition into play as to what it means to be likely. And keep in mind that when we talk about light, likely, we're talking about something that's more restrictive than it could be, it might be, it may be, there's the potential for there to be. And instead, we're saying that likely is that which is neither certain nor proved, but it can be expected. It can be expected by a reasonable observer and that it could be expected based on their logic and experience as an EP or it could be expected because of the available evidence that's uh, uh, been gathered through the major task elements of historical uh, records review, site reconnaissance, and interviews. And so we use and incorporate both of those concepts into likely. And then we've also at the same time put a little bit more responsibility on the environmental professionals, especially those uh, where you've got um, uh, dual signage on a report where somebody is actually signing as the senior reviewer being in responsible charge. Uh, as many of you know, oftentimes the senior review amounts to nothing more than an hour on a timesheet the day that the report left the office. And what we're saying is that's not good enough. That the uh, senior review, the person responsible charge, the EP needs to be involved in the planning of the interviews and the site reconnaissance. They need to be reviewing and interpreting the report. And it's very easy to find out if you're not, we'll just subpoena your timesheets and it'll show whether or not you've been involved throughout the prop process or not. With regards to the CREC, one of the things we're doing now is we're saying, listen, uh, if you're going to call something a CREC, we'd like to see what instrument you're looking at. So you're going to include whatever that agency letter is or deed restriction or what legal instrument that you've been able to identify that demonstrates that you've got a CREC. Now, we're not asking the EP specifically to deal with whether or not that restriction is effective or whether it's applicable uh, and, you know, things have changed or whatever, but we do want to understand how you've come to the conclusion of a CREC. And so there's going to be some sort of legal instrument that you've obtained 
to uh, support your determination of a CRAC. Uh, <clears throat> Self-implemented -imp cleanups are a big pain in the ass, as you know, because now uh, they're pretty pervasive throughout Florida. Uh, the DEP now says if you can clean it up in 30 days, uh, they don't need to be involved. You're just going to maintain the file. Well, the challenge is uh, how are we going to know at the phase one level whether or not there's been any self-implemented cleanups if it doesn't show up in the records review? And how uh, do prospective purchasers be put on notice about f the fact that there's been some sort of spill that's been addressed on the property and it probably is not addressed to the unrestrictive use criteria, there would be no reason for it to normally. And of course, if there is such a thing um, where there's still contamination out there, then we get into the whole issue of continuing obligations and whether or not uh, you can demonstrate that you're not exacerbating the release that's occurred in the past by not doing anything about it. And this could impact your ability to get one of the landowner liability protections to CERCLA, whether it be your innocent landowner defense, your contiguous property owner defense, or your bona fide prospective purchaser defense. So with the self-directed cleanups, uh, you're gonna have to ask the owner specifically whether or not the owner and key site manager, whether or not they're aware of any such things that have occurred on the property. You're gonna have to get a hold of the reports and you're gonna have to review that information and make a decision about what that self-implemented cleanup means. Um, like, as I mentioned, uh, it would probably be highly unlikely that a self-implemented cleanup results in no wreck at all, uh, primarily because um, they're only typically cleaned up to risk-based criteria and not un unrestricted criteria. And then as well, you may not be satisfied with the work that was done. You know, you're you're given work, they didn't, uh, you're given the report, they didn't look for the right thing, or you're not satisfied that they did the sampling in the right place or at the right depth or whatever. So there's a lot of reasons why you may not be comfortable with that self-directed action. And if that's the case, then you wind up with a wreck. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the problem with risk-based cleanup is that there's no way for properties or uh, for instance, zoning hearings to be alerted that there's been a problem with the property in the past. And so you might have a, a site that's been cleaned up to commercial, but it's been since zoned to residential. And because there's no connection, uh, no one realizes it, no one knows about it, which is really why we're uh, you know, pretty harsh on this idea that you've got a document you've asked the owner and key site manager about any self-directed cleanups. Now they may lie, but you know, it's not your uh, responsibility to vet the accuracy or honesty of the people you're interviewing, but you're going to want to document that you did ask. And if there is information available that you get copies of that information. All right. Uh, and of course, then with the CREC, as you know, that typically we've got some sort of control in place. It's still a wreck and we still wanna see that instrument. Uh, and keep in mind that uh, the fact that there's a no further action letter doesn't necessarily mean you got an HREC. If the no further action letter states that it's contingent upon something else, for instance, it remaining commercial property or that, uh, the site uh, remain paved or whatever it is, then you don't have an HREC. You've got a CREC. And as a result, uh, you've got a REC because all CRECs are RECs. So we put a little bit extra information about that as well in uh, our discussion now within the body of the report itself to uh, remind people that if you've got residual contamination, you can't have an HREC. It's going to either be a REC or it's going to be a CREC, depending on what legal instruments you've been able to identify that support the CREC definition. Um, it, only under a circumstance where it's been cleaned up to the unrestricted use criteria and you've got a, a clean NFA or SRCO, would you be able to use the HREC definition? Uh, <clears throat> 
keep in mind that we still do not uh, want recommendations in a phase one, and that's because it's not your risk tolerance that's uh, at issue. The user gets to make their call as to what the risk tolerance is. And there's been litigation recently where uh, gratuitous recommendations have been offered. And as a result, the user was put in the unenviable position of uh, either having to do what their own consultant told them, even though they don't agree with it, or ignoring what their consultant told them to do, and then facing the music in litigation when there's an issue about whether or not uh, you can still satisfy one of your landowner liability defenses. And a classic case of that uh, is the Ashley 2. If you want to take a look at an example litigation, uh, Ashley 2 is a great example where the uh, developer uh, who uh, purchased property that was a manufacturing facility uh, had a phase one. There were a number of wrecks identified, including uh, mach old machine pits, subsurface machine pits that still had oil in them. Um, there was some demo debris. There was a number of things that were wrecks. It was the middle of winter. The uh, consultant offered gratuitous recommendations that uh, the waste material needed to be addressed as soon as possible, that the uh, these old machine pits needed to be cleaned out as soon as possible and so forth. Uh, the developer decided to wait till spring when he'd have yellow iron out there and he had to do utilities in the subsurface. And at that time with the thaw and with his yellow iron out there, he was gonna take care of the debris and the machine pits and all that stuff. <clears throat> and which is what he did. And then he sued the former owner for the cost of remediation. The former owner countersued saying that um, the developer should also pay because uh, by leaving it out there, for six months and allowing the spring thaw that he exacerbated the contamination in soil and groundwater, the result of not addressing it right away. And of course you can imagine exhibit one in court was the phase one done by the consultant who offered the recommendations. So the consultant was in direct contravention with his own client at that point. So bottom line is that we're trying to strengthen the deliverable uh, through bringing some consistency with some of our definitions. Uh, we're trying to bring a little bit more teeth to the concept of what is and is not a significant data gap so that people just don't simply run to the use of a data gap because they don't feel like doing what they should be doing. Um, that the conclusions incorporate all of these things, whether it's Rex, C-Rex or significant data gaps, that you have photos and that you have a site map. These things are all you shall requirements now. Uh, I've already talked to you about PFAS and PFOAs. We've listed it currently as a non-scope consideration in the phase one. Uh, however, as I mentioned to you, you got to be aware of what state you're in because you may have in your individual state, by the way, Florida does not yet. But there are other states that do have instances where they've made it a hazardous substance. We've updated our appendices. We've completely rewritten the legal appendix. I mentioned to you that appendix four is brand new. Uh, we've updated the table of contents. And as far as when you start using 2021, it's really up to you. Uh, ASTM has published the 2021 standards available right now, and you can start to use it. However, you can still use 2013 if you desire to until such time as EPA actually comes out uh, through their daily publication with an acknowledgement of V152721. So both are available to you. And you can decide within your business whether you want to move now to 21, which is okay, you can do that, or whether you'd stay want to stay with 13 until EPA uh, kicks in. <clears throat> so uh, hopefully what you see in this latest revision is that we have taken input from across the country in trying to update what's good commercial and customary practice as required, but also in you know, basically embracing things we're finding out uh, 
different files that are now readily available, uh, different contaminants that are, are starting to gain a lot of traction. And we've updated the standard to embrace these things and acknowledge these things, uh, hopefully to bring a better quality deliverable with a little bit more consistency than what's happened in the past. Uh, and for those of you that have any interest, you know, join the committee. Uh, we're going to be pretty dormant probably for five years uh, before we start the challenge all over again. And I can pretty much tell you that challenge is going to occur without me. I think my my days are, are done, uh, having gone through uh, revisions in uh, 1993, 94, 97, 2000, 2005, 2013, and now 2021. Uh, my tolerance and patience is pretty much gone to the wayside. So it'll be for the next generation to take on what will become E1527, 28, I guess, will be the, the year. Uh, keep in mind, we're also working on a few other standards currently. We're updating the uh, forest land and rural properties to embrace the 2021 uh, phase one standard. That'll be coming out probably later this year. Uh, we're doing the same with the environmental baseline surveys. Um, we haven't done anything with phase two and probably won't uh, for a bit of time now since it came out in 1990, excuse me, 2019. And so that's some of the other things we're currently working on. And with that, uh, I'm happy to take any, I have not been monitoring chat, so. I have, Nick, okay. let, me, uh, let me go ahead and start that process off. Great presentation. Thank you, sir, for giving the update. Uh, I see that picture there, and I actually saw your presentation that you did in Marco. Tell everybody that's on the call about that that group shot there. That, that's wow. funny. I'd be happy to. So um, every year uh, I take uh, the seniors that are graduating in engineering because I, uh, most seniors have to come through me their last year. And so I will... Uh, in one of my larger classes, I've got a class that's got about 120 graduating seniors. So what I do is uh, I take them out drinking uh, after the final exam. And the deal is that the first person that finishes the test gets my credit card. They go to the bar. As people leave, they go to the bar. And eventually I'll wait for the last person and, uh, and then join up with everybody. And typically at that point, uh, after they've been, you know, from, from a bunch of them been there for an hour, hour and a half, I'll do last call and they can hit me good. They'll hit me for, you know, four or 5,000 bucks sometimes, but, um, uh, they got pretty damn innovative last year, uh, or, or the year before and got a hold of one of these kids that through the, uh, university system gets extra time on their exams. In fact, they get double time and they somehow got a hold of that kid. And I had to sit, unbeknownst to me, I sat waiting for this kid to finish his freaking exam. And he took his sweet old time and uh, an exam that should have taken less than an hour, uh, he got two and a half hours for. So by the time I got to the bar, uh, people were well on their way to sailing. And I was left with about seven dimes bar tab. So thank you very much, USF. <laughs> Innovative. I love it. I love it. <laughs> All right. Well, let's open it up to questions. I know Monty Watson. Monty, I'm going to ask if you can go ahead and turn on. Let me uh, ask for you to unmute. I know you have a question. Hang on. Ask to unmute. Hey, how's it going? All right. Can you hear me I, okay? Yep. We got you. Go ahead. Okay, uh, I was curious, the, uh, the part about the uh, uh, property use limitations, doesn't uh, that new definition overlap quite a bit with institutional controls as well as uh, CREGs? It does. So the property use limitation is, is specifically intended to acknowledge both institutional and engineering controls. Where we were getting southwise with, with attorneys is that we used to call them restrictions, property use restrictions, and that brought in a lot of other types of restrictions, including zoning, that we really weren't 
uh, talking about, and that would not necessarily serve uh, the purpose of a C rack. So the fact that it's zoned commercial doesn't mean you have a C rack. Right. It's the idea that there's been a release to the property and that something has been done via legally to acknowledge that there's a release and that there's still contamination there. Okay. Uh, the other question I had um, was about using data from previous reports on the same site subject property. A uh, ton for other clients. That's been the hardest change for me is stop saying subject site. Um, they're typically bound, they're considered privileged information. It's a private document and bound by master service agreements. So we can't necessarily disclose them without client permission. So how is that from a legal perspective? I, I think what it comes down to is just be able to document you made the effort. And if there is such a thing out there, you can identify that it exists. Okay. And I, I don't, be, because so much of, uh, of phase one is, is publicly available information, I still don't see a problem with using information that you're aware of within that report. Um, it, I guess there could be a scenario, I can't think of one off the top of my head, where there might be something privileged within a document. But uh, the idea is that if it's obvious, and if it's available, and if it's obvious, you at least want to demonstrate that you identified and let the user be aware of it, uh, so that it it's going to be out of scope. But if they wish you to, as you said, get permission, that at least they were given the opportunity. Okay, I see. Thanks. All right. Thanks, Monty. If anybody else has any more questions, I'm going to ask that you go ahead and ask them via the uh, the chat function. Just go ahead and ask it and let me know you have a question and I'll, I'll turn on your mic or ask you to turn on your mic. And just keep in mind, everybody, we are recording this. We'll make this available to everybody um, along with the notes that um, Nick is going to provide from the presentation itself. Everybody's quiet today. <laughs> We're going to give it a few more minutes. A minute. All right. Seeing none come through, I'm going to go ahead and close this off. Thank you very much, Nick. I appreciate mm -hmm. your, your time and willingness to uh, give everybody an update. Again, uh, we'll try to bring you more of those down the road. Oh, wait a minute. Hang on one self second. Uh, I see somebody from ProTech. Is the self-implemented cleanup 30 days from release date? I'm not so sure that's a question. No, no. Uh, ah. My understanding is it's from the point that you identified that you had an issue. So you may not even know the release date. You just might have identified on your property that you got a problem that needs to be addressed. And I believe it depends on whether it's hazardous substances or it's uh, petroleum. I think petroleum is actually governed by a volume and hazardous substances are governed by a time frame. Okay, hopefully that answered that question. I'm seeing a bunch of thank yous. I think everybody enjoyed that, Nick. So with that, we're gonna go ahead and sign off and I will, uh, Make this available, everybody post a bound. Thank you, Nick. Appreciate it. Okay now. Bye.